All right, so crash course in graphic design. Uh, so I'm Vanessa Rodriguez and I, uh, I teach, besides being a librarian, uh, I teach an intro to graphic design course in the School of Communication uh, certain semesters. Um, it's in the uh, journalism and media management class, I'm sorry, department. Um, so this is basically a semester's worth of graphic design squeezed into less than an hour. So um, we'll see how it goes. All right, so what is graphic design, right? Um, so a good just text definition, it's, uh, it's visually representing and arranging information that makes it uh, in a way that makes it more appealing and more understandable. Uh, so now let's try to visualize that textbook definition. Um, and we do this, uh, I do this by showing people airline safety instructions. All right, so imagine yourself, you're on a plane, you pick up the pamphlet, and this is what you see. When the seatbelt tight illuminates, you must fasten your seatbelt, insert the metal fittings, you know, try to imagine yourself, try to understand the instructions uh, without any visual cues, All right? Now imagine yourself doing this if you're on a plane from Lima to Cusco in Peru, right? So primarily a Spanish speaking country. Um, how many different languages do you think they would have this pamphlet available in? I mean, that's where the, the graphics come in. So this is a nice way to explain why graphic design is important also. Uh, look at how many different languages there are on the top left-hand side of that, you know, airline safety pamphlets. Imagine if they had to have this many different pamphlets, each one in a different language. And imagine if they didn't have your language, you know, but thanks to the visuals, you have a nice visual cue of what it is that you need to do in case of emergency. All right, so this is another one of my favorite stories is uh, Ghostbusters. I assume you recognize this is the first poster for Ghostbusters. Um, and initially they didn't actually have the rights or they weren't sure if they were gonna be able to get the rights to use the word Ghostbuster because um, as a title, uh, because it was a title of a TV show that had not, that it had been out not that far before that. Uh, so they had to come up with a way to make a poster that made people curious and enticed to see a movie without actually using the title. So we all know the icon, Ghostbusters, you know, ain't afraid of those ghosts, it's got that, you know, red line. And we all recognize it as a no sign, no parking, no turning this way, you know, no U-turn, no smoking. So, you know, using that together with the ghosts gave everybody a pretty good idea. Even if they didn't initially think Ghostbuster, they were thinking, okay, so this is a movie about no ghost. So who's coming to save us? Some kind of ghost hunter, uh, ghost exercisers or something, something to get rid of the ghosts. Uh, so another next point in, in graphic design, because I do teach Adobe Illustrator, InDesign and Photoshop in my classes, you know, anyone can learn how to use Adobe, but can you make your design look good? And this is one of my favorite examples because I am I'm gonna say 95% sure that this terrible flyer was created in Adobe Photoshop. Um, so the person who would create this or something like this knows how to use the tools, any kind of graphic design tool uh, like Adobe, but they don't know how to design obviously because this is kind of a mess. So good design depends on the designer, that's you. <laughs> the tools, uh, Adobe or whichever other tool you're using and design skills. And that's really what we're gonna to discuss today is the design skills portion. So the fundamentals of graphic design. So good design is based on these boxes that I have here, color, typography, composition. And on top of that lies unity, variety and hierarchy. And then you get good design. I'm gonna go through these very in a lot of depth as we go. So the main principles of graphic design being unity, variety, and hierarchy. The text version of that is uh, unity is the presentation of a composition as an integrated whole, not as a mere sum of its parts. Meaning that when you're looking at a design or you know, a magazine or a flyer, you know that each panel, each section is all part of the same thing. It's not doing advertising two separate things. Um, variety. Uh, too much unity is a little bit boring, so you want, you know, obviously some to attract some attention. And then hierarchy. 
when you're working with hierarchy, when you're focusing on hierarchy, you want to make sure that all the elements that are the most important are the most noticeable and that the viewer is looking at everything in the right order. And um, don't worry, I'm gonna go through that. And you can achieve unity, variety, and hierarchy by using good composition, good color, and good type or typography. So that's where we're gonna uh, begin with composition, meaning where to put stuff on your blank page. And to do that, we need to understand user perceptions. So when a designer is starts composing the, the layout, um, we arrange the composition with what we know that the user's brain normally does. There's a way that a user, ourselves included, view certain things um, and we know these things. And then, so we try to design around that. So let me get into it. All right, so I want you to look at this poster and look at what you look at first. You start reading the poster, think about where your eyes go. It's the same thing with the newspaper. What's the first thing you notice? What's the first thing you read? What's the second thing you read? Where are your eyes going? That's because normally speaking, your eyes go from top to bottom. So I can guess that the first thing you looked at in the poster was Stern Grove with that tree behind it. And then you started reading it. Maybe you went down to the website or maybe you went to the admission section, but your eyes started going top to bottom, just reading it down. Same thing with the newspaper probably saw that picture first, you know, maybe they went up to Chicago Tribune and then just started going down. He governed through terror all the way down to the Chrysler signs. Once upon a time in Hollywood, a movie poster. First thing you saw was probably Leonardo DiCaprio's face, maybe Brad Pitt or Margot Robbie. And then you were like, oh, there's the title. And then maybe you started reading, oh, who else is in the movie? Your eyes went from top to bottom. All right, so here, what's the first thing you saw? What about here? You notice the big things first. So uh, as opposed to reading from top to bottom, I would say in the left picture, you saw empire first instead of reading the contents because empire is super large and it takes up half that um, page. Uh, with Binge Britain, there's a lot there that makes you notice Binge Britain first. You know, the designer worked really hard to get your eyes there first. It's uh, larger than everything else. It's right smack in the middle. Um, because it's white on black, it stands out more. Uh, so that's probably where your brain went first. All right, so back to the airline safety features. What order are you looking at these pictures in to read them, quote unquote? You know, if you're looking at the instructions, where do you start and where do you begin? You know, where do you end? And my guess is your eyes went from left to right unless your first language is, moves in a different direction. And I have noticed this with my international students when they're designing something, if the, their main language is not you know, English or it's a language that moves either you know, maybe from right to left or you know, top to bottom, their designs tend to be a little bit different as they try to adjust to you know, Western language settings. All right, so here with the icons, uh, which icon is different? Right? Is it easier to see now which one is different? And that's because you notice flashes of color pretty you know, easily. Your eyes might just tend to go there, especially that one in the right in the middle again, because it's brighter than the others. So my guess is the one on the right, it was you found the one that was different faster than the one on the left. All right, so back to this horrible design that I love showing. One of the reasons why it's horrible is because it just lacks that user perception thing. There's really nothing for you to focus your eyes on. Everything is pretty much equal. Um, that background image is killer. Um, it's, this event is called a rave called Sharon and maybe that girl in the background is Sharon, but she doesn't seem very important because her face is up, either upside down or keeps getting covered by the text. Um, that green on green here in the middle is just killer. Um, nothing really stands out. And one of the reasons I like using music festival examples is because music festivals tend to have a lot of information on it. So you would think it's difficult to make it look uh, nice and coherent, um, but it's really not if you do it well. So with, with this one, I would say 
perhaps the first thing you noticed was the Bigfoot, the Sasquatch. And then your eyes maybe went upwards and you're like, what is this? Oh, Sasquatch Moose Festival. And it's on Memorial Day weekend. Um, and to get into like what's also great about this, like the color scheme, Memorial Day weekend, so red, white, and blue. We've got red, white, and blue here. And then you'll notice that this flyer actually has more artists that are going to perform than the previous flyer. And yet it's so much easier to read uh, because these pops of colors are making it very easy to differentiate, differentiate from each other. You've got the red, you've got the white, you've got the blue. They're alternating. Um, nothing, you know, the background is a nice solid color. Um, you might also notice that the, the bands at the top, the, the font is slightly larger than the ones at the bottom because theoretically the ones at the top should be the, the most important or the bands that the promoter feels are gonna attract the most attention. And then slowly you work your way down to the other ones. All right, so composition, and if you were if you were here last week, you heard me say this, follow the grid. You wanna make sure that everything aligns with each other. But let me show you what I mean by the grid. Uh, the easiest way to see it is actually newspapers since everyone's really familiar with them and they're very much on a grid. Um, so there you can see the purple outlines. And I mean, I can divide this even further uh, because each one of these um, little mini articles here, blurbs, uh, is its own rectangle. And then all these fonts are the same size, all the headlines are the same size. And this one, you've got all the headlines are two lines. Um, I'm gonna guess that this image at the bottom, teen survey finds labor law violations. This image is most likely the same size width as these two columns put together. Um, and then, yeah, it's really easy to see the boxes in, in a newspaper. Um, but you also get that kind of a thing in, in websites. So all these circles are gonna be the same size. All these rectangles are the same size. They're the same distance from each other. They all sit on this imaginary line. So everything is actually, even though you don't see grid lines, it's all on a grid line. And that makes everything looks orderly and it's uh, easier to read that way. Um, so with, with infographics, sometimes people have a harder time because it's usually just so many elements that go on a page together. Um, it's not as clear cut as, you know, just a, a sheet or a flyer or a newspaper. Um, but even in a good infographic, you're going to have things that are aligned with each other. Um, as you can see here, sunspots is aligned with cor uh, coronal mass ejections. This blurb is aligned with this blurb. Um, these two in the bottom are also aligned with each other. Um, the title is aligned with the about blurb. And these are all aligned with each other. Um, everything is has something that is more or less organized with each other. When it's not, you can kind of tell it, it usually looks like a big old mess. Um, so I collect these bad <laughs> typography compositions. Uh, so if, you're, if your, your composition isn't correct, or I should say just off, then things might be a little bit hard to read or your message might get a little bit mixed up there. Um, still not sh I, I guess I can guess that that means don't die, drive safely, but it takes a while. Um, and you can see, don't drive safely, don't die safely. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a whole folder of these, so. All right, so let's talk about color. So many colors to choose from. Right. If you were here last week, you saw this image as well. Um, so when do we use color? Um, for example, we use colors for impact. I also like to use the image of um, England where everything is black and white and then that just one phone booth is red. But I really like this one just because uh, Agent Carter, this is from the Agent Carter TV show. Uh, this is the opening scene, episode one. Everyone's going to work. Everyone's dressed in these dark, drab colors and here is the star of the show she's wearing bold red white and blue um, you know she stands out she's different from everybody else and that's all there just with the color uh, of her outfit walking proudly through the crowd we use color for organization uh, so the left is a section of the subway system in new york uh, as you can see each line is organized by color and I want you to imagine having to figure out which line is going where if all of these were gray. 
So you can see why we use color for organization. Uh, on the right, uh, maybe something you do with highlighters or um, post-it notes, you might arrange different you know, notes to mean different things depending on color. Uh, color for emotion, um, certain colors represent certain emotions. Uh, again, that's also culturally. Uh, so here's um, a flyer for a singles getaway. And it's got this, you know, she's in the pool. And it's like this nice greenish, you know, very love, peace, relaxing kind of a thing. But then it is a singles event. So she's wearing red and red sunglasses and there's red down here, um, you know, more love, passion, so forth. Um, and you'll find that most uh, health organizations, if you go to a, a hospital or a clinic, um, they usually use um, blues and greens. They're more calming colors. Um, so that usually works out there. And then, yeah, like I mentioned, depending on uh, the culture, the colors might mean different things. Colors for brand. So if I was designing a flyer for Starbucks, I'm obviously going to use Starbucks green or anything, you know, related to that. Um, even if I was using, I don't know, even if it was like a special Valentine's Day thing, there's going to be Starbucks green in my in my advertisement for them. It's the same thing with Target. If you look through a brochure, uh, the flyers for Target, you'll find the Target, you know, obviously it's in red, it says Target, but then any font that's red is going to be in Target red. Um, there's Ronald McDonald with the yellow for McDonald's and the yellow and red. It's, you know, that's the logo of the sign you see, the yellow arches or the golden arches and then the red McDonald's. Uh, and here is a uh, newspaper magazine uh, called The Nation. And there was a time period where this is basically the color scheme they were using. As you can see, the colors are very muted. Um, these muted red, greens, and blues. And this is just a selection uh, of what they were using. But you'll see they kind of branded together. Everything had these muted colors. Um, there's no bright green here, except for that one here in the corner, but even then it's not neon green. Um, uh, bad color. Um, in this case, I'm really talking about text on top of a background. Uh, you don't want to have uh, text that doesn't stand out from the background. Um, the red and the green, even though they are pretty, somewhat easy to read, if you were colorblind in that schematic, you wouldn't be able to read it. And red and green, I think, is the most common uh, color and blindness. Um, generally speaking, that, that first bad here with the purple on the pink. Um, so I have the color wheel here. Colors that are next to each other on the color wheel have real bad contrast on top of each other if you were doing text on a background. Um, yeah. And then I also tell people like, you might be able to read this, like you can see the purple, you can see it's as bad. Um, you can read it, you're a foot from your screen, uh, but somebody else might have their computer colors be slightly off from yours, or if they're sitting in the back of the room and you're presenting in person, that projector doesn't always uh, bring out the color very well. So uh, why make their lives harder? Just get some good contrasting colors. Uh, so also with colors, uh, on the left here, we have uh, this series of movie posters that's uh, blue and orange. And it's actually like a graphic designer joke that all action sci-fi movie posters are blue and orange. Um, those are opposite on the color wheel. That's usually a really good uh, contrast, not so much as far as text, but as far as design. Um, if you remember some, some posters like a Jimi Hendrix Experience album is purple and yellow, you know, those are you know, more or less opposite here. Um, the flyer in the middle are these different hues of like blue, green, maybe somewhere between these. Uh, so colors that are next to each other work well as a family of color, as, you know, a nice calm way to, to, to make a design as long as it's not text on a, back, uh, on a background. Um, and then I do have a link here. Let me see if it comes up well. Okay, yay. Uh, so this is from Adobe. It's free and it was always free. Uh, so it's a way that you can um, look at um, different colors and come up with like a theme on your own, perhaps. Uh, you'll notice if you're you know, using 
Photoshop or Microsoft PowerPoint and so forth that they have a color scheme, you know, once you select a theme, um, but you can create your own. And then they also have accessibility tools here that will help you um, make sure that people who do have issues with color blindness uh, can still see um, your, your, your design. So good website. All right, so let's talk about typography. All right, so there are no good or bad fonts, only appropriate and inappropriate fonts, believe me. Having said that, if you're using Comic Sans or Papyrus, be prepared for people to make fun of you. And I don't mean me, I just mean I personally have, this has personally happened and I've seen it happen to other people. And that link on the Papyrus, I won't play it, but it's, it's uh, about a four minute Saturday Night Live sketch of Ryan Gosling uh, just going insane because Avatar, the, the movie promotion stuff is in, in Papyrus. So it's pretty funny. I usually play in class, I give the chance, um, watch it. All right, so choosing fonts. Again, I said there's no bad or good, it's just appropriate or inappropriate. And this is what I mean. There are plenty of fonts that are computer looking or sci-fi futuristic um, to choose from. And this is a perfectly good font for Terminator 2, a futuristic robot movie. They chose a good font. It looks nice. You know, um, there's nothing wrong with the font on the right. It's just wrong for Terminator. You know, this is, unless Terminator was a romantic comedy, in which case that's the wrong picture. Um, that would be the incorrect font for this situation. Uh, so here's the Great Gatsby. And here's the Great Gatsby. So the story here is I had a friend who took three months to choose her wedding uh, font. Um, and at the end, I basically had to shake her and be like, you are saved the dates are gonna get there the day of the wedding. Like you have to choose something. And it boiled down to this. Uh, between these two, only the title, The Great Gatsby is different is the only element that I changed. Um, I'm pretty sure that the book on the left is the original, but I'm not 100% sure at this point. Um, I guess the point is they really look similar. So it doesn't really matter which one you went with. If you have a deadline, just pick one. Um, you might wanna get some feedback maybe. Some people might have a preference, but ultimately there's nothing wrong with either one of these in this situation. Function over form. So it's very important to make sure that uh, your design is interpreted correctly. And that is way more important than it being pretty. Case in point, and I love showing this in class. Um, and I tell my students, because I teach in school communication, I tell them this isn't an art class, it's communication class. So the most important thing is that your message comes across clearly. And again, I have a whole bunch of these. I love collecting those and I, I, my students send them to me also. And that says fast taco. I don't know what you're thinking, fast taco. All right, so uh, type text on a layout. Um, different ways to do this. This is kind of like if it was like a newspaper or it could be a flyer. Um, you can choose one font and just you know go with it. Uh, in the example on the right, there's no reason why the headline can't be in Times New Roman bold. Why not? It would be fine. And then Times New Roman italics for the byline. Uh, bylines are usually in italics. And then the rest of the body copy and the rest of the article would be in Times New Roman. Um, or you could choose a different font for your headline. Maybe you want to pick a fun font or something that goes more with the, the theme. If I was doing an article about Terminator, the next Terminator, maybe my headline would be in Terminator font in a magazine and the rest would be in a nice normal clear font. Um, and then maybe I'll add a pop of color, who knows? You know, I could, I could not. It, it just kind of depends on the rest of the design. So it, it's just an option uh, there. Type don't. Uh, don't use italics and large bodies of copy. Uh, it's difficult to read. Uh, usually italics are kept for captions and photo credits, bylines. Uh, maybe if to add a little bit of emphasis, a quote, uh, but certainly not for a lot of article. Uh, don't use all caps at this point. Well, don't use all caps in the whole article. If you use all caps in a headline, that's fine. Um, but yeah, at this point, we all kind of hear it in our head is screaming. 
Uh, don't use the crazy font for an entire article. Like I said, if I'm use, doing an article on the Terminator, maybe I'll use Terminator font as the headline. Uh, but that's it. My entire article is not in Terminator font. Uh, and don't make your columns too thin. Uh, hyphenation goes crazy in that case. Um, but also don't make your columns too long. Uh, and too long is usually more than day and a half by 11. Uh, we're all used to reading in day and a half by 11 because you know, it's usually what our reports come in, but it's still eight and a half by 11 with usually one inch on each side. So it's actually like six and a half, six and a half inches. It's not really the full eight and a half inches. Uh, but if you were making a poster that was 24 by 36, don't start the sentence on one side and then go all the way to the other, use columns. It's just really tiring on the eye to start from here, go all the way to here, and then come all the way back again, over and over and over again. So yeah columns are the way to go. All right, so now back to the unity variety and hierarchy. I'm just going to bring this all together and show you what I, how color type and composition, no one's here, um, equal unity variety and hierarchy. All right, so this is an infographic by Alberto Cairo. I'm going to give you a second. By now, I'm sure you've already kind of like glanced over it, skimmed it over. My guess is this is the thing you saw first, right? That big giant image in the middle. Most likely that's what you looked at first. And that's great because the entire infographic is really about this type of structure. Um, and then you either went down to the 138 in the big yellow or you went to the left that talks about what it is. Uh, so here, uh, let's talk about the color first. Um, doing a grayscale with hints of color is really nice way of, of adding in color to make things a little bit more interesting to add variety if you will um, if you're not really sure on how to use color grayscale and then one or two hints of color so you'll notice the the text um, is some of the text is red especially in the diagram the numbers here on the right the titles here at the bottom are red and then the yellows are, you know, these circle or in this case, hexagon. Um, the 138 being larger than all the other text here and in this yellow bright color right in the middle, right underneath the large diagram tells me that that diagram with the 138 is probably the most important one of all the ones at the bottom. And then if you really wanted to think, okay, well, what is this about? You're eyes probably went all the way to the left and to the top because we're used to having the text and the headlines and so forth just being at the top left or at the very least the top. So yeah, your eyes probably went here also if you wanted to know more about it. And then, you know, as you're reading through this, you went to these on the right and then the bottom part is even divided by a line, just clear line that tells you this is what you read last. And then if you were reading through this, then this, um, here in the corner above the word infographic is probably what you read last. All right, so this is uh, book covers by Rick Moody. It's just a series of books. And um, you'll notice that they all have kind of the same look to them. They all have this large like gradient uh, backdrop, the, the red, yeah, uh, red orange, this white gray, this like, bluish green and the yellow. They all have the same font. Um, all of the images is basically that one image, uh, or in this case, the cigarettes, you know, smaller than the rest of the cover. Um, and Rick Moody's name is larger because I guess his name, him being the author is more important than the book itself. Um, that's kind of what it's leaning towards, but they're all part of, um, you know, his bibliography and they all have, they all kind of look the same with each other. Um, you get that also if you read any like old Stephen King from back in the day. It, I call it Stephen King font. It's not really Stephen King font, but it's very uh, familiar. So like when Stranger Things came out, I was like, hey, that's Stephen King font. Again, it's not really called that, but it had that same old 70s, 80s horror book vibe. So oh, another good example that I'd like to to show uh, The Godfather. As you can see here, the font, Godfather Mario Puzo, the title, in this case, more important than the author, uh, black and white, very stark black and white. And then 
uh, buy and a novel in red, and then this little hint of yellow also. Uh, so this is the movie poster, the original movie poster for The Godfather. As you can see, they used the same font and that same graphic of the, the puppeteer hands. And then, you know, the main part is also black and white, just like the book was. It's at the top, and then you go down. Ooh, Marlon Brando, obviously more important, at least at that time, than anybody else, because his name is right there, front and center. And then subsequent movie posters of The Godfather, uh, you have him. He's still in black and white. It's still stark black and white, like the original book cover. And then the rose is that hint of red that you have from the book cover. And then a parody, uh, Medea's Big Happy Family, The Godmother, again, same font, stark black and white, the same image as the puppeteer hands. And then in this case, her lips is that pop of red color. So as you can see, the Godfather theme throughout here, um, everything just kind of goes together. You can look at, even if that didn't say the Godmother, you know, um, if you use that font, which I'm sort of saying, it's the Godmother instead of the Godfather, the font says it all, you know it's the Godfather, uh, even without the puppeteer hands, but you usually do have the puppeteer, you know, hands, or is it marionette? I don't know, puppeteer hands. All right, so websites. Um, so websites are also organized similarly. Um, in this case, AutoZone, AutoZone colors, uh, orange and red. Um, you look at the website, they are also orange and red. I mean, remember, we're looking at unity, variety, and hierarchy. So we're unified here by the orange and the red of the logo. You have blue that adds a little bit of variety. Um, all the fonts are probably the same. They're just different sizes. Some are all caps, some are bold, some are, some are not. So that all adds a little bit of variety into. And then the hierarchy is usually, very, it, it, the hierarchy is very important with the website. Um, but thinking about user perceptions, the user is used to a website being organized a certain way. So if you were, you know, looking through AutoZone, checking out, you know, different I don't know, transmission fluids, and you wanted to go back to the home page, you expect that you click on the title of the website and it'll take you back to the home page. And you expect that the title of the home page is somewhat at the top. Uh, if you were going to sign in to see when your order was coming in, you expect the sign in to be at the top. If you were putting things in your cart and you were ready to check out, you expect your cart to be at the top. Uh, any menus and searches, you expect them to be at the top. Uh, but if you wanted to contact AutoZone, if there was a problem, if there was a return, you expect that to be at the bottom because like we just kind of conditioned ourselves this way. Most websites are built that way. Uh, but any web designer uh, knows that and organizes a website in a similar fashion so people aren't lost when they're looking for you know, things on the website. So this is an example of bad all around. Um, there's this big gap here of blue uh, between the menu and the rest of the stuff. Um, the stuff on the left, I'm sorry, the stuff on the right is different shades of blue, and then the left menu items are red. Um, I mean, I get it, it's water to put out fires, but everything is blue and the red just looks kind of awkward there, and it's a terrible fire background. Um, you have this image here that is the same color as this background. I'll get into why that's also bad, but yeah, this is bad uh, all around. The text up here is far away from here. Water on wheels, water on wheels is far away from 49 Ranch. It's, it's, this is, this does not follow unity variety or it's too much variety, not enough unity. Um, I guess the hierarchy is more or less okay if it wasn't for that big giant gap between them. So very sorry. All right, so layout sins. These are like the heavy, heavy don'ts. Uh, and this is based on this book called White Space is Not Your Enemy, which is the, the textbook for the class I teach. Um, but you'll find these layout sins on pretty much any website where um, you're looking up what not to do for graphic design. Um, so I'm gonna go through all of these uh, quickly, one on each slide. Um, things that blink incessantly is a website thing. Um, we don't usually see this anymore, but uh, here is the Captain Marvel website and it was made specifically to look like an old 90s website where you see all the lights are blinking in the background. There's little lights here blinking. So the blinking is really about websites. Oop. 
<laughs> warped photos. Okay, so I'll, I chose an image that I hope everybody recognizes as something that should be a landscape, right? Uh, but you know, I only had a square, so I just shoved it in the square. That's bad. Uh, if you're using a program like this is uh, PowerPoint or Google Slides, um, just you can crop this picture format. Uh, you can crop this to to get it to where you need it to go, or in this case, just oops, I warped it again. There we go. Yeah, don't warp the images because that's bad. Uh, so naked photos, this is what we, I know, I'm sorry, but they call them naked photos, what I'm going to do. Um, so that is considered a naked photo because the top part just kind of blends into the background. Uh, this horse picture would be doing the same thing if I didn't have this black border. Now, this wouldn't matter if, uh, in certain cases, so if I had, let's say I had an eight and a half by 11 inch flyer and this uh, image of the horse uh, took up the entire bottom from one side to the from one side to the other to the bottom and then the rest of the top is white and that's where I have all my text uh, it wouldn't matter but if this photo was just stuck in the middle of the flyer then without the black border then it would uh, matter it would look like this one here where it just looks cut off uh, incorrectly as opposed to me using a fake sky as a canvas for all my text uh, bulk borders and boxes. All right, so this is something that I see with like beginning graphic designers or, or people who have to create flyers with Microsoft uh, um, Word as opposed to like a design program. Um, they usually try to create these boxes to make things that look a little bit prettier, but it just makes it look amateurish, sorry. Um, so use negative space to separate things. And what that means is think back to the newspaper columns. There's no box that is actually separating each column. The, the text just creates its own imaginary box that your brain is kind of visualizing. You don't need to actually fill in the box. So that's what I mean by use the negative space. That space between the two columns, that's the negative space. Um, so if you, if you must use a border or a box somewhere, it happens, then yeah, use an uh, understated one. Not The only time you should use a little jagged line is if you're doing a coupon to cut out. Um, I see very rare instances where that matters. I've seen people do this also, and this, uh, this makes me sad. This is all the same article, but by creating these separate blue boxes, it makes it look like each one is a separate uh, thing when it's actually just one continuous article. Uh, cheated margins. Uh, don't put anything that is important too close to the edge uh, because people have different uh, dimensions on their computers and they might not actually, this might be cut off. Uh, but also if you have boxes in your design, you don't want to put the text too close to the box. You want everything, that little space between the columns of the newspaper, that little amount of space is the same space that should be between um, your box and your text. There we go. That's more or less it. And then the for rent sign. <laughs> so when you have these boxes that you create, sometimes this will happen, this empty area here that looks like something is missing. And I pre-apologize uh, to the students, but um, I will sometimes put a for rent sign there, being like, what is this empty space? Like, do something there or rearrange your text or, or something. It just looks really awkward. Uh, centering everything, also uh, a, a layout sin. Um, centering one paragraph, again, like if it's quote in, in the middle of your design, that's centered, that's okay. If your headline is centered, that's probably okay. But your entire, everything centered, um, no. Uh, four corners clutter, that's what they call it. Uh, basically, it just means adding unnecessary things to your design just because there's empty space and you feel like you need to add something there to make it nice or pretty or something. It's usually just over design. Um, there's no reason for me to add check marks to each section of this area. Um, there's no reason for me to add a trophy at the back. You know, maybe I want to leave the, the happy face, you know, maybe I want to be cute and all, but there's way too much going on there. 
uh, trapped negative space. So there's a space here that has been created because I have an image here. I have text down here creating this imaginary line. And then I have this pink line here. And so what happens is it looks like there's something missing here. Um, I could put a caption about the photo and, and it wouldn't be as noticeable. Um, but this is trapped negative space. It's basically, there's three edges that are creating this imaginary box. And then the fourth edge doesn't have to be there, um, but it just looks like something is missing. All right, so back to, <laughs> I know I hate this design. Uh, busy background is also a layout sin. As I mentioned before, there's so much going on in this background that it's really hard to read the text. And the text is what's important here because you're trying to promote uh, this event and you know you don't wanna make it difficult to read. Um, so when you have a busy background, there's too many things going on in the background. It makes it really difficult to put text on top of it and make the text be noticeable. Uh, a good solid color instead of an image usually works. Um, but you might think, for example, that you, 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 know, you found an image that is fine. Like I had somebody who used bread as the background image and it's like, oh, okay, bread, it's, it's one color, it's beige. No, because there's the toasty part of the bread, there's the light part of the bread. You end up having like 10 different colors and pixels just in the bread. So uh, no, it's, it's easier just to have a blank background. There are some images that work okay, uh, but this is obviously not one of them. Uh, bad bullets, believe it or not, there is a whole website dedicated to having bullets that are not uh, considered aesthetically pleasing or just tacky or cheesy. Um, having the dot seems to be the universal it's okay or, or maybe a square. Um, but yeah, once once you get into these really fancy ones, unless your intention on the on the empty box is to have people some check something in, then yeah, the rest of these are considered to be uh, reaching the limits of good taste. Widows and orphans. Um, this is a pet peeve of mine. Avoid inelegant breaks at the type. Now, this is supposed to be a widow. And then the orphan is that one line that comes into the next part. Um, I've seen people use those uh, invertedly, like when this one's the orphan, that one's the widow. It doesn't matter. The point is avoid it. Um, how do you avoid it? What I tell my students, because I, I, I was the editor of my high school newspaper, um, normally I would just keep adding words or removing words until that one went away. Um, if I'm using InDesign, then I can mess with the leading, letting, sorry, not the letting, the, the kerning and the tracking um, a little bit to, to try to get it back into the previous uh, paragraph or bring something down. Um, but that gets a little bit intensive again. That's if I'm working on, on InDesign. Um, but yeah, I might remove some thes or add an and or something, but yeah. Uh, justified rivers, that's when you know, you've know you justified your text so it's aligned on both sides perfectly. What happens is you get these empty spaces that just, they're, they're really big because they have to, they're forced justified. Um, and I, I avoid that the same way I mentioned, I avoid the other one, I just start adding words and subtracting words until I get rid of that. I don't usually justify my, my text that way, but that is one way to avoid it if you like to justify your text that way or if you have to for some reason. All right, review. We're almost done. So remember when you're creating a good graphic design, you have to think about the user perception. What is the user looking at first and make sure you arrange everything that way. You know, top to bottom, largest thing is gonna be the most noticeable. So if the largest thing on your page is not important, then you should shrink that. Um, left to right, uh, pops of color, so forth. And then the fundamentals of graphic design. We went over color, typography, and composition. And once you've got those right, then that lends itself into a unified uh, design um, using the same colors, the same fonts, just makes everything your brain knows that they belong together, that they are related to each other. And then the variety, so it's not boring. Um, and then hierarchy to make sure everyone is reading everything in the correct order. People aren't lost trying to figure out what they're supposed to be reading first or last or you know next. And all that together um, 
brings in you know good design uh so final tip uh get some feedback i do you know i i still have either my staff or you know other co-workers uh, look at whatever i'm designing and let me know what they think um and then i'll give you some some bad ones uh i didn't design these i said i collect these i just think they're so fun this is healthy burgers not heal thy burgers. I'm not the only person who read heal thy burgers. Maybe you did too, but it's healthy burgers. Um, and then this one, unfortunately, they just put the signs too close together. You know, if they were separate, you would have read sail, but they're right next to each other. So I read Sasa Lele, you know, just like the cat. And then my ultimate favorite, if you see someone drowning, LOL. <laughs> No, it's a drowning person, but I, I saw LOL. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm used to that, you know, text speech now. Um, are there any questions? I managed to get this in down in under an hour. What semester is full of graphic design in less than an hour? Okay, so this uh, is being recorded. It will go up in the Creative Studio Workshop um, website for the remainder of the semester and i will have this powerpoint up you can read all my notes um, with it as well and with that i thank you for coming if you need to contact me there's my information i hope that you can see how awful this design is uh, but if you google graphic design is my passion this is this is the example <laughs> all right thank you